Good to see everyone this morning. I feel like I've seen some of you every day this week. I did see some of you every day this week. We have had lots of activity this week, and I just am so thankful that we have a church that will come together to do the work of the kingdom, from serving our guests at hypothermia to celebrating Alvaro Rodriguez's life, and I, now to come together to worship God. We have... Um, it's been an exciting week. The flowers on our altar are given in memory of Alvaro. Um, so I want you to know that. And I want you to know how much we appreciate all those who helped with hypothermia. The lost are found. The dead return to life. This is the Lord's doing. It is wondrous in our sight. Each week of this Lent season, we are focusing on ways that we can practice a countercultural theology that emphasizes the beauty and the grace of reality of life right now, then waiting with increasing judgment to reach some vision of perfected existence. Our ladder climbing efforts sometimes end up taking us down a rung or two as things don't work out just right. And so let us continue to turn our ladders into gardens, nurturing our souls, and embracing our holy, good enough lives. together. Holy One, God of forgiveness, we call out to you and you surround us with deliverance. You love us infinitely more than we love ourselves or others. Help in us this day to your counsel, helping us be more merciful, more grace-filled, so that we might rejoice in simple and good enough moments that fill our days. Amen. I invite you to remain standing as you are able and sing with me number 294, Alas, and Did My Savior Bleed?
for the children's message, childless for the moment. Well, unfortunately, <laughs> church time is prime nap time for Jeremy. So he's home sleeping right now, which is good and bad because I wish he would stay awake so that when I'm done with church, I could go home and take a nap, but it's okay. It wouldn't be all, it wouldn't be all that bad, except he does get up probably six or seven times a night. So if you think of me during the week, pray that I get more sleep. Um, this morning, um, I want to share a children's message that is... Um, a friend has shared with me earlier this week, <clears throat> and um, I brought a visual aid with me, and it's uh, my husband's belt, and I want us, if we can imagine, that this belt, the length of it, is going to be our timeline of heaven, and the buckle part, right here at the top, the buckle part, is our timeline on earth. Our timeline on earth, about an inch and a half of this belt, is way shorter than the rest of the belt. And I want us to remember and to visualize that this belt doesn't stop here, that it's going to go on. Our timeline in heaven is going to go on for millions and, millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of years. And our timeline on earth is just this very short little piece right here. And all of us, kids and grown-ups, most often, we spend time thinking about this one and a half inch time period on earth. What are we going to do? Where are we going to go? Who are our friends going to be? And many of us spend time thinking about maybe the last half inch of this belt buckle at the top. Ooh, retirement. I'm going to save all my money. I'm going to travel. Where am I going to go? I'm, what food am I going to eat? What vacation am I going to take? And God says, this right here is the tiniest part of our timeline. And it's what we do in this tiny part of our timeline that is going to real uh, is going to have an impact of what our millions and millions and millions of years in heaven are going to be like. If we're using this timeline here for ourselves, we're not laying up the treasures in heaven for the millions and millions and millions of years that we're going to be there. And so this week, <clears throat> I just hope when you're getting dressed, if you have a belt in the house or you're playing with your jump rope or you're tying your shoelaces, then maybe you'll remember that our time here on earth is just this little, little part right here. And our time in heaven is much, much longer. Our time in the afterlife, right? Afterwards, we're either going to spend eternity in heaven or we're going to spend eternity in hell. And we have to make use of this time here on earth to accept Christ as our Savior, and then to be disciples of Christ to other people. So I hope this is a good visual aid for everyone. Let's pray. God, we pray that we would use our very small, short time here on earth to first accept you as our Savior, and then to be disciples of Christ. Amen. Today, we will hear how the prodigal son lives high on the hog, and then famine strikes the land of his dream vacation. And so he heads home, tail between his legs, expecting that he has lost it all. To his surprise, his extravagant failure is met with extravagant love and grace. We can be pretty hard on ourselves when things don't go as planned. Guilt, shame, and fear of being seen as a failure can leave us wallowing in the pig pen. Our delusions of a perfectible life keep us appointed in ourselves, disappointed in ourselves. Truth is, life is a big old risk. Every single day and facing whatever each day holds is not only good enough, but worthy of love and grace. Do you find yourself being unrealistically hard on yourself? Let's take a moment of silent reflection.
Hear this compassionate word from the second letter to the Corinthians. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view. We no longer know him in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. Know that already God is working in and through you, embracing you and loving you. And God is offering us freedom from feeling alone and fixing what feels oh so wrong with this world, inviting us to let go of the need to be God so that we might recognize that God is with us, offering courage in difficulty. And know that despite our sometimes faltering steps, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are being forgiven even now. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. In Christ, the lost are found and the dead return to life. In Christ, we are a new creation. Let us celebrate our inheritance and the joy of our homecoming as we pass the peace of Christ this day. Turn and greet your neighbors with the peace of Christ. Scripture lesson this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, verses 1 through 3, and chapter 11, or sorry, uh, verses 11 through 32. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in desolate living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. 
For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatty calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, listen, for all these years, I have been working like a slave for you and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. A word of God that is still speaking. Thanks be to God. Have mercy upon me, O God, because of the blood of your Son. Blot out my transgression, I pray. Forgive all the wrong I have done. No merit I claim, I acknowledge my sin. It is Let my healing start, restore. 
restore the joy. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thine sight. Amen. Accepting help is hard for many of us. We want to do it ourselves. We don't want to depend on anyone else. We want to prove to ourselves and others that we can do it, whatever it is. We know what's best for us. But we're a nation drowning in credit card debt, a clear sign that we have trouble handling our finances ourselves. There are an unknown number of companies offering to help you out of your credit card debt. These wouldn't exist If we didn't need help, there's a market for it. There are problems. And credit card debt is not the only thing we need help with. We need help with so much more than our finances. But we let our pride get in our way. And we say, I know what's best for me. In our passage this morning, there are two sons. And both sons thought they knew what was best for them. And they found out that their father had different ideas, different plans. Both sons had to admit how they were feeling, that they were feeling negative so that they could move forward. And we have to admit that we need help, that we aren't perfect. And it's okay that we're not perfect. In fact, it's to be expected. Now, the first of the sons is the one who got the text named after him, the prodigal son. And the prodigal son decides he wants to go off on his own because he knows best. He insults his father by saying, give me what's owed to me. That's, can I have my inheritance now? I, I know you're not dead yet, but I want the inheritance anyway. It's rude. It's un kind. It's thinking that it's telling a person that their value is more to you dead than alive. So he says this to his father. Most Jewish fathers would be very insulted and would not be interested in giving the son his portion. But this father is different. He gives to the son his portion. And the son goes off. To this land that he thought was just the blessing. It was going to be great. That was the place where great things happen. At least he thought so. He was looking across as the the grass is greener in that field. So he goes off and he squanders his inheritance in, in living a... Life of ill repute, I should say. He just parties away his money. He finds himself starving and out of money. And he goes and he works with the pigs, feeding the pigs their pods they would eat. Now, remember, this is a Jewish person. And pigs are unclean. So he is dealing with unclean animals. This was a humiliation for him. 
and he wants what the pigs are eating. He is so hungry that that seems the best thing for him. He finally wakes up to himself and he says, I know what I'm going to do. My dad's hired hands are eating better than I am. I'm going to go to my father and admit my mistake and ask that I'll be hired on as one of his hired hands. I'm not going to ask to be restored to my full place as his son, but just that I might be a hired hand. So he goes off to his father. And when his father sees him still a long way off, his father rushes out to him. Which no Jewish father of this time would do because that is um, just not something that would be done. He would wait for his son to come to him. It's like those parents, and maybe I'm one of them, that wants their child to come home. Yes, it's nice to visit you there, but when are you coming here? I want you here. I'll wait for you here at our home. But his dad doesn't do that. His dad rushes out. He puts a robe on him. He puts a ring on him. And he kisses him and throws himself around his son's neck. And his son gives his prepared speech, Father, I have sinned against you and against God. He confesses. And he asks to be a hired hand for his father. And his father welcomes him home as as his son. Not just a hired hand. He doesn't give him the I told you so lecture of, well, you know, I tried to tell you, if you went off with the inheritance, you were just going to spend it all. No, he welcomes him back. There's no conversation about, have you learned your lesson, son? There's no conversation about, well, I guess you have spent all my money. There's no conversation about, you really messed up this time, didn't you? The father's just welcoming him home. He kills the fatted calf, and there's a party for the son and his friends. There is great rejoicing because the son has come home. Well, the son has a brother, a brother that sees all of this and is furious. His little brother has gone off, wasted his inheritance, has done unspeakable things, and now he's home, and he wants another chance. And not only that, but his father gives him another chance, and he gives him a robe, and he puts a ring on his finger, and he has a party with a fatted calf. He can't even go inside where his brother is. He can't even admit that it's his brother. In the scriptures, you see that he says, your son, not my brother, your son. I'm not claiming him. He's so angry. He's so resentful. He's done everything. Everything the father wanted. He has been with the father day and night, and he deserves, he feels, something, something more, especially than what the other son gets. I mean, the prodigal, he gets a party. He gets a party with a calf, a fatted calf. The older brother doesn't even get a goat that he can have a party with his friends. He certainly doesn't get the robe and the ring and the royal treatment. Oh, he's so angry. He resents that he's the one that stayed home and did the work. He resents that he's the one that listened to his father and obeyed the rules. He, he resents it. And his father says, why aren't you going inside? What's, what's wrong? And the older brother explains to him how he is angry and resentful. And the father explains to the older son, well, son, we've got to celebrate your brother's back. 
It's like he was gone forever, and now he's back. We've got to celebrate. I've had the joy of having you with me. It's not wrong to celebrate the younger son. The older son has had the privilege and the honor of being with his father and serving his father all the time. He's never known what it was to be separated from his father. Whereas the prodigal, he knew very well what it was to be cut off and separate. This parable Jesus tells to answer to those who are noticing who he spends time with. Sinners and tax collectors. They feel that that's not really something a Messiah would do. A Messiah, Son of God, would be above all that. Would be above eating with those people. But you see, Jesus offers grace. God offers us grace upon grace, an abundance of grace, no matter if we deserve it or not. There's no argument that the prodigal son did wrong, but he's forgiven because God forgives us. The Father forgives us. No matter how wrong we have been, no matter what sin we have done, there is reconciliation. There is a welcoming home. You know, some of us have done horrible things. Some of us have done not so horrible things, but things we're ashamed of. Things we don't want anyone to know about. Things that are just a mistake. And we live with the shame of that. We don't want anyone to know that we're not perfect. We are so far from perfect, we think, oh, we can't let anyone know. We can't let anyone see these faults that we have. But God loves us, knows all of our faults, knows our shortcomings, knows our limited abilities, and loves us anyway. And God wants us to leave behind the shame and the guilt so that we can be more fully a part of God's kingdom. Now, for some, especially in church, I've seen the resentment creep up. The resentment creeps up when we see others who are who live their whole lives making poor choices and then all of a sudden they decide to follow Jesus and they're forgiven whereas good church people we're doing what God calls us to do we're working hard for the kingdom of God and we don't even get a goat God calls us to let go of that resentment and anger. Because we have gotten to know what it is to be in relationship with God for all these many years that the other ones were missing out. We're not being punished. We're getting to be in relationship with the Father. And the Father doesn't get angry with the older son when he's resentful. Instead, he explains it. There's no judgment, there's no criticism, there's no, you shouldn't do that. The same is true for us. God loves us. No matter what we have done in our past, no matter what we can't forgive ourselves for, God can forgive us and love us and offer to us the robe and the ring and the fatted calf. 
or if we are resentful for those who seem never to have to work for anything and it just gets handed to them. They're forgiven too. This week we've had hypothermia, and I don't know how our guest ended up in homelessness. I never asked. I'm sure there are as many stories as there were people. Some of them, I feel certain, have made poor choices. And those poor choices have helped get them to the place they are now. Some of them may not have made any poor choices, just had dealt with life the best they could, and they still ended up that way. Now, they are prodigals. They're trying to come back. They're trying to find their way after everything that's happened. Some of us in the kitchen of serving didn't want to give them too much because, after all, they didn't do anything for it. And I didn't hear anyone say this, but I know the feeling that happens with people who are serving others. So don't say, I wonder who said that. I don't know anybody. But there's a certain amount of resentment that builds up with with church folks. Because we've been doing it all along, and why should someone else get free, a free ride. Why should I give them the best? Why should I give them roast beef? Let them eat chicken or whatever. Let them have something, um, I don't know what doesn't cost a lot these days, but um, everything costs a, a fair amount. This day. No roast beef for them. They're, they're the homeless. They'll get what we serve them and they'll be grateful and we'll put it on their plate and we're not going to offer them a choice because that's just what they deserve. If they don't like it, that's too bad. They're getting a free meal. They should be happy. Now, that's not what we did. In case you weren't here, we offered our guest and we called them our guest because that's what they were. We practiced hospitality. We welcomed them as we would be welcoming someone to our home and we offered them a choice of what we had. Would you like this? Would you like meat sauce or vegetable or um, vegetarian sauce for your spaghetti? What would you like on your taco or your burrito? We didn't do that because they deserved it. We did that because we know what it is to be loved by God the Father. We didn't do that because we're just such great people. We did that because we know what it is to experience the love of God. And we wanted to show the love of God through our actions. In order to know the forgiveness of God... We have to have faith that God can indeed forgive us. We have to have faith that when we confess our sins, we are a new creation in Christ. And that is sometimes hard to do. Think about Abraham for a minute. Abraham goes up the mountain with Isaac and God has told him to kill his son. Now that takes a lot of faith and he takes the wood and he take, he's up there with his son. He believes He has faith that God will take care of the situation. And God does. God provides an animal so that animal can be um, sacrificed instead of a son. God provides a way for us to experience forgiveness and new life by Jesus. Because Jesus died for our sin. Jesus came and lived among us and paid the price for our sin. 
And because of that, we can indeed be a new creation. We can let go of the shame, the guilt, the resentment that might be buried within us. We may not talk about it, but I imagine most of us have some of those feelings, if not all of them, at different times. Jesus loves us so much that He was willing to die for us that we might experience new life, an abundant new life. So we need to stop trying to be perfect. We're not. We've made mistakes. Sometimes they are resenting what other people have, wanting what the neighbors have. Sometimes it's what we actually did, we know we did, and if anybody else found out what we did, oh, be so embarrassing. We're not perfect. We've all sinned. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. We have to accept that we're good enough. Yes, we're working to be more fully the people God created us to be, but where we are right now is good enough. What we're doing right now is good enough. If we can't let go of all of the guilt, we can't experience that good enough feeling. If we can't let go of some of that resentment, and know that God accepts us as we are, then how? How are we ever going to move forward? So I invite you this week to think about your attitudes. When you are judging others for what they've done, what they haven't done, what they should have done, and when you're saying God loves them, and I'm going to leave the judgment part of it to God. I invite you to think about when you're trying to hide your imperfections. Instead of accepting that nobody's perfect and this is just the way it is. God wants to love us completely and fully. God wants to offer to us a new life in Christ. And we can only do that by allowing God's grace to work within us that we can accept forgiveness and that we can move forward. harshly and we know we often turn the blame on others a particular attitude of blaming happens in our culture that has identified goodness with bootstrapping effort so many of us who so many who are victims of systemized oppression are blamed for their own circumstances they end up being deprived of just resolutions to the deprivation that results from unjust systems. As individuals and as a society and as a church, we must work to eradicate this kind of blaming and its resulting layers of suffering. Oh Lord, we pray for those who were our guests this week. We pray that they might have experienced your love through us. 
We pray that this coming week, they will continue to experience your peace. We pray for those who are in danger. We pray for those who are unsafe. We pray, Lord, your blessings on the situation in the Ukraine. We pray for those families who have fled from their homes because their homes were not safe places to be. Empower us, Lord, to do your good and perfect will. Empower us to accept your grace. We pray for those listed in our bulletin as well as those whom we've left unnamed. We trust you, Lord. We trust you to bring healing, comfort, relief. We trust you, Lord, to be our Savior. And now hear us as we pray, Lord, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now is the time in our service where we share in our offering of gifts and tithes. I want to invite you to share either online down at the bottom of our homepage or in the back of the sanctuary for those of you who are here. This is a chance we have to respond to God's grace. Let us pray over these offerings. Generous God, in light of your extravagant blessings, no matter what the state of the world or our imperfect lives, we offer our gifts and ourselves and know that you transform what we plant into the produce of love. Amen. I invite you to remain standing for our closing hymn, which is number 292, What Wondrous Love Is This?
creation, especially the broken bits, and Jesus, our companion along the crooked path called life, and the Holy Spirit who loves to improvise in surprising ways, go with you, dwell among you, and give you joy. Amen.